night in this country. Uh, to my left, I'm glad to be joined by Dr. Howard Zucker. To my right, I'm glad to be joined by Secretary Melissa DeRosa. Let's talk about where we are. Start with the facts that we know. In terms of handling the COVID virus, uh, we're doing better than we've ever done before. The number of hospitalizations is down. Uh, it's continued to drop. The reduction in the number of intubations is down. The three-day average of new hospitalizations is down to the lowest level ever, which is really good news. We're doing a significant amount of testing. As you know, we're testing more than any state in the United States. We're testing more per capita than any country on the globe. Uh, and the tests are very relevant because they, they're a snapshot in time. They tell you where you are on that day. Yesterday, we did about 50,000 tests, uh, which is a tremendous uh, number of tests. Less than 1,000 people tested positive. Uh, that is the lowest number we have had since this began. And when it began, we were only doing three or 4,000 tests. We now did 50,000 tests. Uh, so the, the progress is just uh, phenomenal. And that's the rate of positives uh, from our testing, remembering that the testing has increased exponentially. And we have the lowest number of deaths that we've ever had at 54. Uh, and there will be a level at which that number can't drop any lower, right? Because uh, people who are gravely ill and contract the COVID virus, uh, it's going to be a bad outcome. But that number is dramatically different than what we were looking at for many, many weeks. The question is, where do we go from here? Uh, no doubt the initial objective was getting control of this COVID virus. Uh, situation has got more complex since then. But on the reopening, five regions upstate have entered phase two. Uh, that's good news. Western New York is expected to move to phase two tomorrow, uh, and we expect that to happen. We have uh, the data that we've been tabulating during phase one in Western New York. All the data looks very good. We're going to have the global experts go through it today. I want to make sure we're not missing anything. This is new for all of us. Uh, it's not what county executives do. It's not what governors do. Uh, this is very detailed research of statistics what clusters might pop up, et cetera. So uh, we also have global experts review all the data for us because this question of closing, opening, countries have gone through this before. There is a body of knowledge to know. And uh, we're, we also go to global experts who we've enlisted who have gone through this with other countries where they closed, they opened, they got into trouble, they had to close again. Uh, but uh, they're looking at it now. We want to make sure they get the latest data. We'll have a final announcement later this afternoon for Western New York, but uh, the conversations I've had with them are all good, and we expect Western New York to go to phase two tomorrow. The Capital District region is uh, moving to go into phase two on Wednesday. Again, all the numbers look good there. Uh, we're going to run them by our global team to make sure they are as good as we think they are. But uh, at this point, the capital region is also on track to go into phase two on Wednesday. Uh, what we have done with this COVID virus is a really amazing accomplishment if you take a step back. And it was all done by the people of this state. They did it. 19 million people did what they never did before. They responded with a level of determination and discipline that uh, I was amazed with, frankly. 
uh, and I am a lifelong New Yorker. But what they did uh, was unlike anything I've seen. Remember where we were. We had 800 people die in one day. We had the worst situation in the United States of America. At one point, we had the worst situation in the globe. And we're now reopening in less than 50 days. Now, it was a long 50 days. Uh, I can recount every one of them. But we went from a really internationally terrible situation to where we're talking about reopening today. Even New York City, where we're planning to reopen uh, June 8th. And that was just 50 days. The whole closure period has been about 93 days. Uh, yes, it was a disruptive 93 days. I know. But look at what we did in 93 days. We went from the worst situation on the globe to actually reopening. That's where we are. We should be very proud of what we've done. Just don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. We're talking about reopening in one week in New York City. And now we're seeing these mass, mass gatherings over the past several nights that could, in fact, exacerbate the COVID-19 spread. We spent all this time closed down, locked down, masks, socially distanced. And then you turn on the TV and you see these mass gatherings that uh, could potentially be infecting hundreds and hundreds of people after everything that we have done. We have to take a minute and ask ourselves, what are we doing here? What are we trying to accomplish? We had protests across the state that continued last night. They continued across the nation. Uh, upstate, we worked with the cities very closely. The state police did a great job. We had uh, basically a few scattered arrests upstate New York, but the uh, local governments did a great job. The people did a great job. Uh, law enforcement did a great job. The protesters uh, were responsible. And uh, it wasn't great, but it wasn't bad either upstate. And I said from day one, I share the outrage, and I stand with the protesters. You look at that video of the killing of an unarmed man, Mr. Floyd, it is horrendous. Horrendous. It's frightening. It, it perverts everything you believe about this country. It does. And there's no excuse for it. And no right-minded American would make an excuse for it. So protest, yes. Frustrate, be frustrated, yes. Outraged, yes, of course. And is there a larger problem? Of course. It's not just Mr. Floyd. It goes back, there are 50 cases that are just like Mr. Floyd. We've had them here in New York City. What's different, the difference between Mr. Floyd and Amadou Diallo? or Abner Loima, or Eric Garner. What is the difference? What have we learned? Nothing? So yes, we should be outraged. And yes, there's a bigger point to make. It is uh, abuse by police. But it's something worse. It is racism. It is discrimination. It is fundamental inequality and injustice. My father spoke about it in 1984 in a speech called The Tale of Two Cities. People still talk about it. The point of The Tale of Two Cities is there's two Americas, two sets of rules, two sets of outcomes, two sets of expectations. And it's true. It was true then. It's true now. Look at our prisons and tell me there's not inherent injustice in society. Look at public housing. Tell me there's not inherent injustice. 
Look at what happened with this COVID infection rate nationwide. More African Americans infected, more African Americans dead proportionately than white Americans. Of course, this chronic institutionalization, institutionalized discrimination, there is no doubt. There is no doubt. And there's no doubt that it's been going on for a long time and people are frustrated and it has to be corrected and it has to be corrected now. And there's no doubt that this nation, as great as it is, has had the continuing sin of discrimination. From before the nation was formed, and it started with slavery, and it has had different faces over the decades, but it is still the same sin. That is true. That is true. So let's use this moment as a moment of change. Yes. When does change come? When the stars align and society focuses and the people focus and they focus to such an extent that the politicians follow the people. That's when change comes. Well, the leaders lead, baloney. The people lead. And then the politicians see the people moving, and the politicians run to catch up with the people. How did we pass marriage equality in this state? Giving a new civil right to the LGBTQ community. Because the, po the people said, enough is enough. How can you say only heterosexual people can marry, but the LGBTQ community, they can't marry? How is that constitutional? How is that legal? You have your own preference? God bless you. But how in the law do you discriminate between two classes of people? We passed marriage equality. After the Sandy Hook massacre, all those years we tried to pass Common sense gun safety. Do you really need an assault weapon to kill a deer? But then the Sandy Hook massacre happened, and the people said, enough. You're killing children, young children in schools with an assault weapon in the Sandy Hook massacre? Enough. And in that moment, we passed common sense gun safety in the state of New York. Record income inequality. People said enough and passed a real minimum wage in this state that went all across the nation. There's a moment for change. And is there a moment here? Yes. If we're constructive and if we're smart and if we know what we're asking for. It's not enough to come out and say, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. Okay. And what? Well, I don't know, but I'm angry and I'm frustrated. And you want what done? You need the answer. Well, I want common sense gun reform. Okay, what does it look like? Here it is, three points. Well, I want to address income inequality. Okay, what do you want? Here's what I want. Minimum wage of $15. Free college tuition. What do you want? Do you want to make that moment work? Yes, you express the outrage. But then you say, and here's my agenda. Here's what I want. That's what we have to be doing in this moment. And the protesters are making a point, and most of them are making a smart, sensible point. But you have to add the positive reform agenda that every voice calls for so the government the politicians know what to do. And there is a positive reform agenda here. There should be a national ban on excessive force by police officers. There should be a national ban on chokeholds, period. There should be independent investigations of police abuse. When you have the local district attorney doing the investigation, I don't care how good they are. There is the suggestion of a conflict of interest. Why? Because that DA works with that police department every day. And now that prosecutor 
is going to do the investigation of the police department that they work with every day? Conflict of interest can be real or perceived. How can people believe that the local prosecutor who works with that police department is going to be fair in the investigation? And it shouldn't be state by state. Minnesota Governor Waltz put the Attorney General in charge. Good. In this state, I put the Attorney General in charge of investigations where police kill an unarmed person. Good. But it shouldn't be the exception. It should be the rule. There is no self-policing. There's an allegation, independent investigation. Give people comfort that the investigation is real. If a police officer is being investigated, how is their disciplinary records not relevant? Once a police officer is being investigated, if they have disciplinary records that show this was a repeat pattern, how is that not relevant? And by the way, the disciplinary records can also be used to exonerate. If they have disciplinary records that say he never, she never did anything like this before, fine. That's relevant, too. We still have two education systems in this country. Everybody knows it. Your education is decided by your zip code. Poorer schools in poorer communities have a different level of funding than richer schools. In this state, $36,000 per year we spend in a rich district, $13,000 in a poor district. How do you justify that? If anything, the children in a poorer community need more services in a school, not less. How do you justify that? You can't. Do something about it. You still have children living in poverty in this nation, where when we had to, we found a trillion dollars to handle the COVID virus. But you can't find funding to help children who live in poverty? No, you can find it, United States. You just don't want to. It's political will. When you need to find the money, you can find it. Let's be honest, the federal government has a printing press in their basement. When they have the political will, they find the money. The federal government went out of the housing business and never re-entered it. We have a national affordable housing crisis. Of course you do. You don't fund affordable housing. I'm the former HUD secretary. I know better than anyone what the federal government used to do in terms of affordable housing with Section 8 and building new public housing. And we just stopped. And we left it to the market, and now you have an affordable housing plan. That's what we should be addressing in this moment. And we should be saying to our federal officials, there's, a, there's an election this year, a few months away. Here's my agenda. Where do you stand? Say to the Congress, the House, and the Senate, where's your bill on this? I heard some congressional people talking, saying, well, maybe they'll do a resolution. Yeah, resolutions are nice. Resolutions say, in theory, I support this. Pass a law. That's what we want a law that actually changes the reality, where something actually happens. That's government's job, is to actually make change. Make change. You're in a position to make change. Make change. Use this moment to galvanize public support. Use that outrage to actually make a change and have the intelligence to say what changes you actually want. Otherwise, it's just screaming into the wind if you don't know exactly what changes we need to make. And we have to be smart in this moment. The violence in these protests obscures the righteousness of the message. The people who are exploiting the situation, the looting, 
That's not protesting. That's not righteous indignation. That's criminality. And it plays into the hands of the people and the forces that don't want to make the changes in the first place. Because then they get to dismiss the entire effort. I'll tell you what they're going to say. They're going to say the first thing the president said when this happened. He, they're going to say, these are looters. Remember when the president put out that incendiary tweet? We start shooting when they start looting, or they start looting, we start shooting. That's an old 60s uh, uh, call. The violence, the looting, the criminality plays right into those people who don't want progressive change. And you mark my words, they're going to say today, oh, you see, they're criminals. They're looters. Did you see what they did, breaking the store windows and going in and stealing? And they're going to try to paint this whole protest movement that they're all criminals, they're all looters. That's what they're going to do. Why? Because they don't want to talk about Mr. Floyd's death. They don't want people seeing that video. They want people seeing the video of the looting. And when people see the video of the looting, they say, oh, yeah, they're, that's scary. They're criminals. No. Look at the video of the police officer killing Mr. Floyd. That's the video we want people watching. Now, I don't even believe it's the protesters. I believe there are people who are using this moment and using the protest for their own purpose. There are people who want to sow the seeds of anarchy, who want to disrupt. By the way, there are people who want to steal. And here's a moment that you can use this moment to steal. You can use this moment to spread chaos. I hear the same thing from all the local officials. They have people in their communities who are there to quote unquote protest. They're not from their community. They don't know where they're from. Extremist groups. Some people are going to blame the left. Some people will blame the right. It'll become politicized. But there's no doubt there are outside groups that come in to disrupt. There is no doubt that there are people who just use this moment to steal. Why, is it coincidence that they broke into a Rolex watch company? That was a coincidence? High-end stores? Chanel? That was a coincidence? That was random? That was not random. So can you have a legitimate protest movement hijacked? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And there are people and forces who, who will exploit that moment. And I believe that's happening. But we ha still have to be smart. And at the same time, we have a fundamental issue, which is we just spent 93 days limiting behavior, closing down, no school, no business, thousands of small businesses destroyed. People will have lost their jobs. People wiped out their savings. And now, mass gatherings with thousands of people in close proximity one week before we're going to reopen New York City? What sense does this make? Control the spread, control the spread, control the spread. We don't even know the consequence for the COVID virus of those mass gatherings. We don't even know. We won't know, possibly for weeks, the nature of the virus. How many super spreaders were in that crowd? Well, they were mostly young people. How many young people went home and 
kiss their mother hello or shook hands with their father or hugged their father or their grandfather or their grandmother or their brother or their sister and spread a virus. New York City opens next week. It took us 93 days to get here. Is this smart? New York tough. We went from the worst situation to reopening. From the worst situation to 54 deaths in 50 days. We went from the worst situation to reopening in 93 days. We did that because we were New York tough. New York Tough was smart. We were smart. We were smart for 93 days. We were united. We were respectful of each other. We were disciplined. Wearing the mask, it's just discipline. It's just discipline. Remembering to put it on, remembering to pick it up, remembering to uh, put it on when you see someone, it's just discipline. But it was also about love. We did it because we love one another. That's what a community is. We love one another. And yes, you can be loving even in New York, even with the New York toughness, even with the New York accent, even with the New York swagger. We're loving. And that's what we've done for 93 days in a way we've never done it before, never in my lifetime. Never in my lifetime has this city and this state come together in the way we have. I don't think it ever will again in my lifetime. Now you can say maybe it takes a global pandemic for it to happen. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. And I don't know that the power of what it was like when it came together might not be so beautiful that people want to do it again. Remember when we all acted together during coronavirus and we rallied and we knocked coronavirus on its rear end? Remember when we all wore masks and we all had that hand sanitizer? Remember what we did? Wow. When we come together, we can do anything. And it's true. It's true for our state. It's true for our nation. When you come together and you have one agenda, you can do anything. You want to change society? You want to end the tale of two cities? You want to make it one America? You can do that. Just the way you, you knocked coronavirus on its rear end. People united can do anything. We showed that. We just showed that in the past 93 days. We can end the injustice and the discrimination and the intolerance and the police abuse. We have to be smart. And we have to be smart right now, right now in this state. And we have to be smart tonight in this city because this is not advancing a reform agenda. This is not persuading government officials to change. This is not helping end coronavirus.